Welcome to my C++ on C 2023 talk entitled New Algorithms in C++ 23. My name is Connor Hookstra. I go by code underscore report online. Usually you can search my name, but if for some reason that doesn't work, you can also search uh, my alias. We're going to do a, a little bit of an about me, and uh, we're going to go through this quickly because I'm assuming maybe some of you folks have seen my talks before, but uh, I've been in the industry for about 10 years now. Most importantly, I've been working at NVIDIA for I think my four-year anniversary is a couple months away. And uh, for the entirety of that time, I've basically been a professional C++ developer. I consider myself a polyglot programmer. I know a ton of different languages, but uh, professionally I get paid uh, to program in C++. Although technically I'm in research now, so I can choose whatever language I want to, but NVIDIA, obviously one of their languages that they support is uh, C++ and CUDA C++. So um, on top of this, you know, back when I was at Amazon, Haskell became my favorite programming language for a period of time. And then in the last two to three years, I've become an, a, a huge array language fan. If any of you guys listen to my podcasts, uh, you will know that. And we're actually going to see a bit of Q code today in this presentation and sort of uh, learning some of the functionality that's been introduced in C23. Um, a couple other things I mentioned before YouTube, I've had a channel since 2017, over 300 videos, Twitter for a few years. I also organize a programming languages virtual meetup. Uh, we cover different textbooks. Currently, I have uh, delegated that to another individual by the name of Leslie. They're working through two books right now, but we've gone through the structure interpretation of computer programs. I believe the second one is category theory for programmers, seven languages in seven weeks. If you're interested, they meet online virtually, so it doesn't matter. I mean, time zones might be an issue, uh, but sometimes they record them so you can even watch them after the fact. On top of that, I have three podcasts, uh, two of which are probably of interest to the folks in the audience here. So uh, my co-host of ADSP is sitting in the front row, Bryce Lelbach. So we both work in NVIDIA. Uh, we primarily talk about C++, although we've gone through different phases. We talked about Rust a little bit. We've had discussions, and we're going to try and branch out to other languages. Um, but we talk about mostly algorithms, sometimes data structures. Sometimes we just talk about Bryce's walnut furniture. Um, and ArrayCast is a podcast that I uh, host with four other people, and we talk about different array languages like APL, BQN, J, Q, if you're interested in those. I also have a running podcast, probably not of interest to the crowd, but if there are some runners here and you want to check that out as well, um, I think across all three of them, there's like 200 episodes, so lots of content. You can find links to all of this stuff at my GitHub repository content, uh, which you can find underneath my username code report, and uh, there are going to be a lot of code examples. There's going to be a ton of code in this talk. Um, if you want, you can go to the slide deck, which is underneath the talks subfolder of the content, uh, but also... Uh, if you just want to look at the code, all of them have Godbolt um, links. So the, both the C++ and the circle code we're going to look at. If you want to look at that interactively, not on a slide, you can go to the uh, uh, Godbolt links. On top of this, if you don't want to go to my GitHub, I posted this, uh, the main repo in the Discord underneath this talk track if you want to go in that and follow along. But hopefully you should be able to see everything in this room. All right, so overview for the talk. We're going to spend... 20 minutes, 25 minutes, talking about sort of uh, algorithm land overview and sort of the new ranges that have been introduced in C++23. And then we're going to spend the majority of the talk focusing on examples. Uh, the big one that we're going to talk about is the second um, sushi for two. We're going to do a warm-up problem. And uh, note that I have chocolates here. So if you ask a question or answer a question, you will get a chocolate while they last. Um, and hopefully I won't uh, injure anyone in the process. Um, but yeah, we're going to focus most of this talk on examples, but first we're going we're to take a look at sort of the landscape of algorithms as they exist in C++23. So C++ algorithm land overview. There are currently what I consider three verticals when I refer to algorithms. And the first is what was introduced in C++98, and that are the iterator algorithms. Hopefully, everyone in the room is familiar with these examples. You basically have algorithms like find if, count, et cetera, accumulate. They are either in the algorithm header or the numeric header. And you typically are passing iterators, usually two. Some of them take more. And this is how you pass a range or a sequence to these algorithms. This has been in C++ since the first standard, ISO C++ 98. And uh, then in C++ 20, we added overloads. This is the second vertical. These are basically the exact same algorithms. There are some small semantic differences in the return type. Some of them return result structs. But effectively, these are semantically the same algorithms, but now they just take a range. So you can see that the only difference between find if in C++ 98 and range colon colon find if in C++ 20 is that we're no longer passing the iterators. Now we're just passing a range, which is fantastic because 
if you use the algorithms, you should be irritated a little bit by always having to pass dot, bin, dot begin, dot end. It's a little sad that we, in the real estate that we uh, gain by getting rid of begin and end, we sort of lose that to the ranges colon colon namespace. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a, you win some, you lose some, but I have seen in a lot of code examples that some people alias that using namespace sort of stood r equals to something, um, or they just do using namespace stood ranges. I don't recommend that, but there are alternatives. The point is, it is very nice that we have now these sort of range overloads of our C++ algorithms that we got in 98, 11, 14, and 17. So these are the first two verticals, which we're not really going to be talking about today. The vertical that we're going to be talking about is the third vertical, which is the C++ 20 and 23 ranges. So I refer to these as algorithms, but technically in the standard, they're referred to as range factories and range adapters. So you know, loosely, I consider all three of these algorithms, but technically in ISO standard speak, the first two are algorithms and the last vertical are ranges, range adapters and factories. Factories are things that produce things like IOTA and repeat, we'll look at those in a sec, and adapters are things like transform and filter that sort of adapt your sequence or range that you have. So this is my mental model. If you don't like it, you can completely ignore it, but this is what I like to think about as sort of the three different verticals of algorithms as they exist in C20 and C23. And so we're gonna be focusing on the last vertical today in this talk. So on the screen, I have five ranges currently. And one of these is from C23, and four of them are from C20. But this is just a subset of what exists. So I am technically leaving a few sort of utility ranges, like single, off the screen. These are the more interesting ones that I find myself always reaching for. Single and other ones like that are interesting. So if you're thinking this isn't comprehensive, you are correct. There are a few missing. But these are the more kind of algorithm range factories and adapters. So everything in the first column is from C20, and everything in the second column is from C23. And so this, I'm not sure if this is the most pedagogically useful slide of the talk, but this is basically an overview of range land as, as it exists today in C23. And I should also say, if at any point there are questions, you do not have to uh, wait to the end. Feel free to raise your hand or just shout something out. I'm happy to take questions and throw chocolates out. It makes the talk more exciting. You'll notice that a couple of these have things in parentheses to the right. So elements have keys and values, and adjacent and adjacent transform have pairwise and pairwise transform. The things in parentheses are aliases. They're not actually new uh, range adapters. They are just things that are alias. So elements is a range that basically will transform over a tuple-like thing, and you pass it a template argument, and it, it extracts out the index of that element that you sort of, the index that you pass in. So element zero gets you the first element from a list of tuple-like things. Elements one gets you the second element from a list of tuple-like things, or a range of tuple-like things. Keys and values are just aliases for elements zero and elements one, which I actually am not a huge fan of because keys and values are semantically sort of in the context when you're dealing with like a key value associative container kind of thing that you turn into a range, but a lot of times you're not dealing with that and you can still use keys and values, which we'll see later. Um, adjacent and adjacent transform, these are both templated range adapters that we're gonna talk about later, and pairwise, uh, is the basically when the index that you're passing to it or the, the integer that you're passing to it is two. So adjacent can take two, three, four, five, six. Pairwise is the shortcut. Once again, if, you, if you're just using two, I don't actually like pairwise. You'll never see me use it in my code because I prefer adjacent transform and just spelling the two. It's basically the same length and I think pairwise is just one extra thing we have to learn, but it's worth pointing out. So we are now going to very quickly go through each of these. So this is, uh, there's a link in the links MD in sort of the content. We're gonna blow this up a little bit, but this is an active Godbolt link. I've included the ranges and sort of the using namespace just so you can see them for now. We're gonna use uh, C++17 string literals. Uh, we're not gonna use the std colon colon views namespace. Note that this is also, I think, an alias for std colon colon ranges colon colon views, but we're, we're using that so we don't need to clutter the screen and we can blow this up a bit. And so we're basically gonna get rid of everything we don't need and make this a little bit bigger. And we're gonna go through these one by one, sort of very quickly, just to get a high level overview. I think most of these are pretty intuitive, but if you've got questions, feel free, we can pause and look at it a little bit closer. So, the uh, first one we're gonna look at is IOTA. Hopefully, everyone's familiar with this because IOTA has been in C++ since C++ 11. It was actually the fifth numeric algorithm that was added. It didn't uh, show up in C++ uh, 98. So, IOTA combined with Chunk. So chunk is a C++ 23 range adapter that basically you, you pass it an integer and then it's gonna chunk up your range into sub-ranges of that length. So if you give it iota five, it's gonna give you back the first two elements, then the next two elements, and there's no overlap. So it's zero, one, then two, three, and then four. Hopefully that makes sense. The second one is one of my favorite range adapters, chunk by. And this is actually called 
several different things in other languages. In D, it's called chunk by, but in Haskell, it's called group by. So you might know this under a different name. And this is basically like chunk, but instead of taking an integer, it takes a binary predicate. And any time that binary predicate fails, it starts a new subrange or sublist. So in this case, we have the sequence nums is 00112. And when we pass it the equal to binary predicate, it's checking whether elements that are adjacent to each other are equal. So the, the binary operator is applied to adjacent elements. So when it's applied to 0 and 0, those are both true, so it stays in the same list. But as soon as it hits 0 and 1, they are no longer equal to, so it starts a new sublist. So basically, chunk by equal to will store contiguous equal values together in subranges inside a whole range. One of my favorite algorithms, it's super useful. We're going to see it in an example uh, coming up in the talk. The next one is slide. This is basically a sibling algorithm to chunk, but instead of having non-overlapping windows, it has overlapping windows, and the step is 1. So where with chunk, we had 0, 1 in one subrange, and then the next one was 2, 3. Now we have, with a sliding range of 3, 0, 1, 2. Then we take one step, it's 1, 2, 3. Then we take another step, and it's 2, 3, 4. So they're very similar, but sometimes you don't want overlapping you know, subranges. Other times you do. Stride is kind of in the same boat, but it basically, I think Stride is a not so great uh, name for this. I believe Elixir calls it uh, nth or every nth, and I, I think that's way more descriptive, but basically that's what it's doing. It's taking every nth uh, of the integer that you pass it. So with Stride 3, it takes the first one, and then it skips 3, and then skips another 3. So if we give it iota 10, that's 0 to uh, 9 inclusive, you'll get back 0, 3, 6, 9. The next one is repeat. This is one of the simplest uh, range factories. So iota is another range factory. It takes like a single value and generates a range. Repeat basically just takes a value and repeats that. And note that this will repeat infinitely because ranges are lazy. So in order to get this to output, we have to do take five here, which gives us just five, five values of 42. So zip transform, if you're familiar with uh, range v3, this is called zip width in range v3. And that's because Haskell calls this zip width. But uh, when we standardize this, we don't really have any precedent for underscore width, and our mapping function is called transform, which is basically what the width is indicating. So this takes a variadic number of sequences and combines them with an operation that has the arity, the number of arguments, equal to that number of sequences. So here, we're doing a sort of uh, binary zip transform that takes two sequences, the same sequence nums, and then we need a binary operation because we have uh, two, basically, sequences or two ranges. And so here, we're just calling plus, which is going to add them together. So effectively, we're doubling the values of our original sequence, which is 001122, giving us 002244. Then we the Yes, yes. So a uh, great question from Roy. He asked, if you have uh, two different lengths, uh, what happens? You basically take the shortest one. So if I were to um, have two different sequences, one of length 5 and one of length 10, it's just going to short circuit whatever the shortest length is, which is uh, the similar behavior to a lot of lazy functional languages like Haskell. Um, and <laughs> threw it to the wrong person, but uh, I was only, it was off by one error, off by one error. Um, <laughs> All right, so the, uh, the next range adapter is uh, basically a sibling to uh, zip transform. It's zip transform without the transform. Or you can effectively think of zip transform just with a sort of operation. So this takes a variadic number of sequences. Here we're just passing two iota sequences, and it's going to zip those together. Super, super useful. In fact, Python has had this, I think, from the get-go. And like, when I first discovered it in Python, and I realized, wow, like, there's so many times you want to write a for loop or something and just do this nice little zipping behavior, but instead you're indexing into two different lists. Very irritating. The fact that we have zip now with range-based for loop and structured bindings, you can write some really, really Pythonic, elegant code in my opinion. Now we're going to move on to adjacent and pairwise. Once again, pairwise is just an alias for adjacent two. So this is looking at adjacent elements, uh, the number of them specified by a template argument. So here we're passing two to that template argument. And it basically is just going to look at sort of intuitively adjacent elements. So when you pass two, you're going to get two at the same time. This is similar to slide. The difference is that slide returns you a range of ranges. Adjacent is going to return you a range of tuples, which might be nicer depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, in, in my cases, I basically am always reaching for adjacent uh, because it's e easier to destructure those versus when you have a range of ranges, you end up calling like dot .begin, dot .end, and stuff. And pairwise is just an alias for this. So similar to zip transform and zip, we now have adjacent transform and pairwise transform. Super, super, I think this is one of the most undervalued or underrated algorithms, not just in C++ because it just showed up, but this exists in Haskell as map adjacent, in Kotlin as zip with next, a ton of other languages. I think the utility of this algorithm, especially in a parallel context, is like widely, widely misunderstood. 
so basically, it's doing the exact same that adjacent and pairwise does, but similar to zip transform, it applies a operator that has the arity of the number of adjacent elements you looked at. So here, we're once again applying a binary operator plus, which is just basically adding adjacent elements together. And we're almost uh, getting to the end. Join with was added because we kind of messed up join in C20. So now if you have a, a range of strings, you can concatenate those strings with sort of a delimiter, which is a very common thing in many other languages. The fact that we kind of messed that up in C20 is a bit sad. Uh, but now we have it. And the last two are Cartesian product. If you were just in Tina's talk, you will have seen this one. This is super useful. An odd name, but if you look at sort of uh, you know, category theory or even I think iter tools and Python calls this product, um, it basically is just a nested for loop. And if you're familiar, familiar with an outer product, it's basically just a flattened outer product. So it takes two sequences. If one's of length three and one's of length four, you end up with three times four pairs of values, and that's going to be 12. And it's basically just all the different combinations, which is very, very useful if you're trying to do like nested for, -like, for loop-like stuff in C, and you're trying to switch to ranges, this is going to be the range adapter that you switch to. And you can see that we're using sort of 0, 1, and A, and Z. Uh, I only did sort of length two because it's hard to fit the little comments on the screen. But you can obviously do, it's very attic. You can do as many sequences as you want, and then you get a ton of elements. And last but not least, I always forget about this one because Enumerate had been worked on in the standard for years. And uh, I believe Quarantine was trying to do some fancy stuff with it. Uh, they ended up throwing out all that fancy stuff, and they put it in at the very last minute. So I think this is actually the last range adapter that got into C23. It exists in Python under the exact same name. I actually prefer the name zip with index, because that's exactly what it's doing. I would have even gone for zip with iota. I like zip with index better. But basically, it just takes a sequence, and it turns each element in that sequence or range into a tuple of an index and then the value which is super, super useful a lot of the times when you're iterating through some, some like string. But you also need the index. Well, now you have to switch back to an index-based for loop instead of using the range for loop because you don't have an index there. Now with enumerate, you don't have to do any of that stuff. For loop, and you can do basically structure binding, uh, de decoupling of the sort of uh, index and element in your sequence. Fantastic. So that was sort of a whirlwind question. Yeah? I believe it's by value, right? No, it, it's going to be the reference type of the. Of the so, so the I'll repeat the. The tuple will call the reference. The 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 question was when you are creating all these tuples in these uh, sequences like adjacent or these adapters like range, uh, uh, sorry, um, adjacent, etc. Um, what are you doing? Are you doing that by reference and by tuple? And we have our local resident expert Tristan here who said it's the reference type of the value. Well, the reference type of the range. So it's the reference type of the range. Yeah, you can. All right, we're going to try and not off by one. Nailed it. Any other questions before we go on to the, the next point? Did most of those make sort of sense? All right, fantastic. Does anybody know? Oh, question. Can you specify the step for uh, slide? That is a great question. So the question was, can you step up, um, specify the step length for slide? So by default, it's one. And the answer to that is no. But in many other languages, I actually gave a lightning talk, I believe, at CppCon 2019 that was called Slide, Stride, and Chunk that sort of profiled what these were called in different languages. And I think Kotlin has a function called Windows or Windowed, and a lot of languages have. They have both like a slide, a chunk, and then like a generic version where you can set the length of the window and the length of the step. Uh, but we do not currently have that in C++ um, 23. I don't even think it's proposed for C++26 at the moment, but if it's something that you would like, feel free to write a proposal. And I wouldn't be surprised if in the next 10 years it, it shows up. Yep? Is there a nice way to do uh, a, a, like a before and after that uh, on the join with, so that you've got the prefix and then it's on the final or first element? So the question was, is there a nice way to do like a prefix suffix thing after the join with? The answer is no, not yet. But there is a range adapter in C++26 that is proposed called concat which you're actually going to see in this talk, but not in standard C++23. I switch over for one example to range v3 because it does have that. So that is a super useful function, and it's on the way. Also, there's like five different types of candy here. If you don't like the type you got, feel free to just come and swap after the talk. Um, any other questions while we're on this slide? What? Oh, yeah. I was going to say, I mean, there's no, but good point. Bryce pointed out that I'm missing a semicolon on the, first, uh, on the second line. I will fix that for CPP North. 
Well, I mean, we got rid of the, the format print statements, so I don't count the range adapter ones, but I am inconsistent on the first two, so Bryce, Bryce is, uh, he's got a keen eye for that. So, does anybody notice a couple of these range adapters that stand out? There's a pattern, but some of them don't adhere to it. So someone said some of them take template arguments. That is correct, but that's not the pattern. There's an inconsistency, uh, whereas just some of the ranges are templatized, and that's just by design. But there's an inc Some are pipeable, some are not. Yeah, so Bryce in the front row has pointed out that some of these uh, range adapters are spelled with a pipe, but then was it arbitrary that I didn't spell others with a pipe? And the answer is no. And this is sort of a little hint. We didn't need the hint, but you can see here that I'm spelling this one by just passing the, the string uh, to enumerate, but I can also pipe it because enumerate is pipeable. However, the variadic range adapters are not pipeable, and this is heartbreaking. Um, and, and you can see that what's the reason for this? Well, with zip transform, all the other range adapters sort of take the sequence as the first argument, and that's what the pipe operator does. You overload it, so basically it's just a little you know, uh, expression you know, rewrite where Instead of uh, you know, passing it as the first argument, you just pipe it, and then the pipe is going to overload and then basically do that replacement for you. But with zip transform, the first argument is not a range or a sequence. It's your operation. And why is that? Well, when you're de designing variadic functions, typically your variadic sequence is at the end. Therefore, you, you, don't really, you can't put the operation at the end, so we just decided variadic range adapters are not pipeable, which is heartbreaking. We're going to talk a little bit about why later, but this is just something important to note. Zip transform, zip, and Cartesian product are all variadic. They can take any number of sequences, and because of that, you can't pipe to them. So, most importantly, oh, question? Yeah, so you can zip arbitrarily as many as you'd like. Yeah, which is why, which is why we have the restriction of not being able to overload them with the pipe. So the question was, um, can you take as many, an arbitrary number of sequences with the variadic ones? And the answer to that is yes. So this is uh, important information. We've been talking about all this sort of cutting edge, bleeding edge stuff. Uh, can you use this in your compiler? Uh, it depends on what your compiler is. So GCC 13 just got released in May. This is coming out in 2023. Uh, depending on when you're watching this in the future on YouTube, this will obviously have changed. But GCC 13 basically has support for all of the C++ 23 range adapters. They're missing a few things, ranges, colon, colon, two, and formatting. Uh, MSVC, depending on which version you're working with, I believe v19.latest on Compiler Explorer uh, maps to 19.36, and they have everything except for a few, and Clang has absolutely nothing. Uh, that's Clang 16. I'm missing the 16.0 right there, but uh, the, the latest Clang does not have anything at this moment. So this is the sort of most important slide. This is actually the first link in the links.md file, so if you want to go take a look at this, I update this frequently. I just updated this yesterday, so I believe today is June 29th, 2023. Uh, all of the ones in yellow for MSVC in the third column have been merged and are done, but it takes a little bit of time, one, for the you know, merges to make it into a release of an MSVC compiler, and two, uh, I believe the Microsoft folks are the ones that submit the PRs to Compiler Explorer, so by the time I'm giving this talk again in a month at CPP North, this actually might all be green, which is then going to make look Clang look uh, a little bit bad. But yeah, so GCC on Gobbolt, you can use this, and MSVC, depending on the ones. It's adjacent, adjacent transform, Cartesian product, uh, enumerate, pairwise, and pairwise transform. But note, all the, mar all the work for this, I believe, was merged at the latest uh, was uh, March of 2023. So all the work is done. Thank you to all the open source folks that you know, worked on Microsoft and GCC. And if you're interested in doing some of this for Clang, uh, there's an opportunity here, clearly. All right, we're going to go on a small digression. And this is a huge left or right turn, whichever you want. Um, and this is just to highlight something that I realized uh, back in January. So uh, my boss put this paper uh, on sort of my radar. And it's become my favorite paper of like the last year that I've read. It's called Parallel Block Delayed Sequences. It's about sort of parallel algorithms and how you can map them to GPUs and stuff. Uh, but most interestingly, 
when I was reading the introduction, it says, collection origin programming is a style of programming in which programs use operations over collections of values such as map, reduce, filter, and scan. Some of my favorite algorithms. And then it goes on to say that this style started back in the 1960s with APL, which is my, my second favorite language of all time. And the, my first favorite is BQM, which is just a newer APL. Um, and then it goes on to mention a couple other languages. FP, which is a, a language that comes from a 19, I believe, 80, or no, 79 paper by uh, John Backus that was, can we be liberated from the von Neumann languages? He introduces a language, FP, here, which is extremely interesting. Um, if you go to the second page, it continues to say, collection-oriented programming with stream fusion has gained recent popularity in the programming community as demonstrated, for example, by C++20 ranges library. And it goes on at the bottom of the paragraph to say that this also exists in Java 8 with the streams library. And so uh, there's also a talk. If you don't want to read the paper, there's a 20-minute talk. And in this talk, not only do the Java streams and C++20 ranges, he adds Rust iterators. So if you're familiar with Rust and the iterator model, that's basically the exact same thing, and lazy lists in general. So this was, I sort of knew this informally, but had never seen it articulated explicitly, that uh, in different libraries and languages, you have this um, paradigm that I had never heard the term before. It was actually invented in the 1990s. Uh, I can't remember which, I think maybe it was out of Carnegie Mellon University. And um, the point is, is that this library, C++ 20 and 23 ranges, exists in other languages under other names. So Rust calls them iterators. Java and Elixir calls them streams. And all of the libraries implement stream fusion, which basically means you get like a linear runtime, one pass, and O1 memory for most of the range, range adapters and, and algorithms. And in certain languages, Smalltalk and APL, you don't have the stream fusion, but these are also considered languages where you have data structures, like in, a, in small talk, you know, you've got your objects, your uh, collections, et cetera. APL, is, you've got your arrays. And in Haskell, you've got your lists. And it's kind of a subset of functional programming. I think my next slide sort of calls out, we interviewed Tristan, who's also in the front row, on ADSP. And he mentioned that he refers to this in his trainings as sort of functional style. It's like a subset of functional programming that doesn't necessarily mean pure functions and referential transparency and all of that stuff, algebraic data types. It just means you have sequences, and you're applying operations to those sequences. And that is what I call now collection-oriented programming. So the point of this digression is just to point out, one, these kinds of libraries exist in other languages under different names. And two, sometimes they even exist as whole languages. Like I consider Haskell is a functional language, but you know, it's also a collection-oriented programming language because you're typically dealing with lists and applying operations to them. So put that in your vocabulary next to functional programming and object-oriented programming and imperative programming, et cetera. So end of digression, which we're doing pretty good here, so we're, we're, we're getting to the warm up. So that was just all the background, algorithm overview done, and now we're gonna start to look at examples. But before we get to the, you know, the, uh, they're gonna get pretty intense, we're gonna just do a very simple warm up question. So opportunity uh, to win some chocolates here. So this is basically counting the number of negatives in a list of integers, in our case, a vector of integers. So here, this I believe is a C++, 11, or C++ 98 solution. We're not using anything, anything new here. We're uh, basically declaring a local variable count, index base for loop, and then looping through any time we see a negative number, doing a plus plus. So what is the C++11 feature that you can add to this? Keep the same style, but just slight improvement. Uh, well, there we go. So I heard a bunch of correct examples. The correct uh, one I was looking for was just a range based for loop. So algorithm is coming up here in a sec. And uh, this is just a slight improvement. I always like to show it because I know that there's some people that watch talks and they haven't been keeping up with the, the latest and greatest. So if you don't know about the range-based for loop, it's fantastic. All right, the next thing I believe we're going to do is just we're going to switch this to function deduce return type, which is C++14. Then we're going to go back to C++11 if we actually put the trailing return type. I love this style, and you know we just add it for fun because I'm up here on stage. Now the question is, what is the name of the algorithm? All right, like 20 people shouted out the correct example, so I'm just gonna put the chocolate down on the table, and everyone can come up and get a chocolate for that's left at the end. But yes, count if is the name of the algorithm that we're looking for here. And this is the C++ 98 version because we're passing the iterators. Of course, we can now switch to the C++ 20 version. No more iterators. We do have an increased namespace, nested namespace, but that's what you have to do. And there's one final solution because this code is irritating to me because all we're doing is comparing a value with zero, with less than. But I have to spell bracket, bracket, paren, auto e, n paren, brace, return e, less than zero, semicolon, n brace, semicolon, or uh, n paren, n brace, or n semicolon. And that's just like, all I want here is the less than and the zero. Everything else is noise. Uh, we could use bind, but that's also gonna be expensive. So I have written a library uh, <laughs> that uh, basically adds, it's a combinator library, but it also adds a bunch of convenience functions 
I know a lot of people are going to hate this, but if you ever find yourself wanting a really short way, like I think in Python, actually, they have like LT, LTE, GT, GTE. It's a common sort of well-known thing. When you see LT, it means less than. Uh, you can use this. So this is called Blackbird. Uh, it's on GitHub if you want to check it out. And we're going to use Blackbird quite a bit in the later examples because it, it makes me happy. Um, all right, that is, I believe, the end of the warm-up. However, Whenever I give these kinds of talks where I take a for loop and I refactor it into an algorithm, inevitably, somebody says, does anybody know? Why should I read or know all these terms? Why can't I write them down? Yes, Roy, with another chocolate. You ready? I almost hit someone. Off by one error again. Someone says loops are easier to read. And you know, they're easier to understand. Everyone knows what they are. If I want to go use these algorithms, you know, they're called something different in every language. It's so much work. You know, for loops are just so simple. And I disagree. I mean, I think we're professionals, and we should be expected to learn our libraries and use them. It, it you know, gives us the ability to do things like abstract and you know, parallelize those algorithms and do tons of great things. However, you know, I do agree in some sense that like, a for loop is a simpler primitive on a lower abstraction level. So in a certain sense, they're not wrong. I just think everyone should do the work to learn them. But this is like, sort of one of the main points of this talk, because now I get to introduce one of my favorite problems of all time which is Sushi for Two. So this is a problem that I actually solved in a competitive programming contest back in 2019 when I was super into competitive programming. It's not a hard problem, but when I, I read the problem, I was like, ugh, I got to go write this in C++, and it's going to be a pain. Uh, but in Haskell, I knew how to do this in like four lines in 10 seconds. So I spent 10 minutes figuring out how to do all the main IO, monad stuff, just so I could solve the solution not in C++. And I'll show you that solution a little bit later. But first, let's, let's go through what this problem is. And it's one, of, it's one of my favorite problems of all time. You can find this in a repository called Top 10, which has 10 different problems, which are these sort of little algorithmic problems that we talk about on the podcast all the time. Anyway, Sushi for Two, this is the first time I'm talking about it in a talk. You're basically given a list of ones and twos, which represent two different types of fish. We're going to call the blue one tuna and uh, the brown one a puffer fish, because I think that's what it is. And the goal is, is that you and your friend are going to this sushi restaurant, and you want to maximize the number of sushi that you're eating collectively. But there's a bunch of rules on how you can order this sushi. So you're going to get given a list of these one and two values that represent these two types of fish. So here are the rules. One, you have to choose a contiguous set of fish. You can't just pick and choose. So it has to be in a row. Two, you and your friend have to eat the same number of fish. Three, you like tuna, and your friend likes puffer fish. So you're not going to eat the fish you don't like. And four, uh, what is four? Oh, you, you, you can't skip around. So um, when you choose the fish, it has to be partitioned by the fish. So it has to be all tuna and then all puffer fish, or all puffer fish and then all tuna. So in this example, does anybody know what the answer would be? Equal amount, you each like two different type, contiguous, and they're partitioned. Last four. Last four. You've already got a couple. Of a couple of chocolates that we're going to throw. Oh, I hit the roof there. It still made it to her. <laughs> so the answer to this is the last four. So it's contiguous. It's partitioned. Um, you have the same amount, and this is exactly what you want, and it's, and it's in, in a row. Um, so we're going to look at one more example just to make sure, because it's important to understand the example. It's pretty simple, but if, you, if you're lost at this point, you're not going to understand anything past this point. So anybody know the answer for this sequence? I heard six over there, which is correct. So it's the, the three and then the three. So I'll throw another chocolate. I think it was... I'm not even sure if you were the person that yelled it out. But uh, so this is sushi for two. Pretty simple problem. So question. Wait, couldn't you keep the last two in a row? So in that case, it's not partitioned then. Because you go tuna puffer, tuna puffer. When you want to just go tuna puffer or puffer tuna. So you can't, it has to be like a stood partition on the type of fish. But great question. So that was, yeah, can you include the last four? The answer is no. Um, so. The whole set has to be contiguous. So yeah, you can't. The, the question was, does the whole thing need to be contiguous, or can you find like three fish here and three fish over there? The answer is the whole thing needs to be contiguous. So, how do you solve this before C plus plus twenty three? And we want to solve this efficiently, both time complexity wise and memory complexity wise. Think about it for a couple seconds. We're not going to go through the solution in detail. But this is why I love this problem so much, is because when I, I read this, you can make the argument that that count if, you know, the translation into a for loop. Maybe the for loop is you know, using a count if for one local variable and like a three-line for loop, which you can actually make a one-line for loop if you get rid of the braces. It's 
you know, you can make the argument that like the for loop is just as easy to read. I disagree. I think countif is more expressive, but you can make that argument. With this solution, you cannot make that argument. And this might, this might not even be optimal. You might be able to find a way to express this with less locals. But basically, like when I naively did this without trying to do anything fancy and just do it in a single for loop, you need to keep track. What's your current type of fish that you're looking at? How many in a row has it been? What was the previous in a row that you were looking at? And what was the local or uh, global maximum of sort of the comparison of those two lengths and taking the minimum? So there's, there's four pieces of state. And like I said, you might be able to get this down to three. It doesn't really matter. The point is, is that like, this is unwieldy. And if I just throw this piece of code in front of you and you have to figure out what it's doing, it's impossible to decipher. And there's also the, you know, the, the gotcha of, you know, because we're using a range-based for loop, even if we're using an index-based for loop, you have to check like the last, the last group. And so you either have to do that by checking, is this the last index? Now do a comparison. Because usually, you do that comparison when the value of the, ch the fish changes. But for the last sequence, how do you deal with that? I did it by just basically copying some of the code and putting it at the end. But you have to deal with that somehow. But with the ranges code, which we're going to see in a sec, you don't have to worry about these sort of corner cases. This is now what's possible in C++23, which just makes me incredibly happy. We're going to pause, we're going to pause for a second. And then I'm not even going to explain this now. We're going to solve this in Q. And then we're going to come back to C++ because Q, I think it's almost easier to understand this from an array language perspective and then translate it into C++. So Q is an array language that's used in the finance industry. Uh, it's a super interesting language, but uh, we're going to walk through just by example. So uh, SF2 colon braces and then X is basically how you define a function. This is just the identity function returning you. X is your argument. So they don't name their arguments. You can, but this is the simpler way to do it. And this is just a visualization of our, our unit test, basically, that we're going to modify as we build this up. So the first thing we want to do is we want to chunk this list into basically sublists based on equal value. So we're going to call chunk. And now we have a list of lists. And uh, this is basically going to enable us to figure out how many in a row do we have of each kind? Once we chunk this, we now basically want to map the length of each of those sublists. So in Q, their map is called each, and their, their length is called count. So we just count each for the chunks of x. So now we've got the lengths. Uh, after this, we basically want to do an adjacent transform, which is what they call prior. So prior is a function that looks at two adjacent elements and takes a binary operation. And in our case, we want the minimum. So if you, if, we, if you go back, you can see we're going to be looking at adjacent elements 1, 2, 2, 1, 1, 3, and 3, 2, and then taking the minimum of each of those adjacent pairs, which is fantastic. I believe the next slide um, shows sort of a comparison of what these are called in different languages. So adjacent difference um, is what we called this in C++ 98, as Tina pointed out in the previous talk. It's a terrible name because it encodes the default, default binary operation semantics into the name. But you can see at the bottom there, we got adjacent transform in C++ 23, which is a better name for this. And in Q, it's called prior. Kotlin, it's called zip with next, which is actually my favorite name. Um, but we called it adjacent transform because it's more consistent with previous names. Um, anyways, interesting to know that. Uh, there's one sort of uh, problem with this, and that's that we are including the first element of the input sequence to be the first element of the output sequence, which is exactly what adjacent difference does. But we don't want that first element. If that first element is a large value, it's going to basically make our solution incorrect, because you're not taking the minimum of two adjacent values there. So this one underscore is how you drop the first element. So this would be equivalent of a stood colon colon views colon colon drop one in C++20. So once we have these minimum values, we basically just want to take the maximum of them, which is a single function max in Q. And then, of course, we have to multiply this by 2, because there's two people eating this amount of sushi. And so that 2 should change to a 4. So this is the Q solution. And now we're basically going to build this up in C++23. And it's almost identical. And this is the point-free version. We can get rid of the brace and the x by just putting a colon colon at the end. You've got to love this stuff, because array language programmers, every character counts. Um, which C++ developers don't know about. But <laughs> um, so this is our sort of initial uh, sushi for two function. And this is just the identity function right now. It's just returning you whatever you pass in. And we're going to do the exact same transformation that we did previously. So the first thing we want to do, anybody know the name of the C++23 uh, range adapter that we want to call here to do what we did first in Q? Chunk, Chunk by. Who's, who said the underscore by? Was it Roy again? All right, Roy. Feel free to share if you're, you don't want to get uh, you know, sick. Uh, so chunk by. Um, and note that chunk encoded sort of the default binary operation equal, but here we need to explicitly spell it. So chunk by stood equal to turns our range into a range of ranges where uh, they're separated sort of by contiguous equal values. After this, does anybody know which range adapter we want to call? 
Uh, close. We actually want to do that. You can answer. Is it transform? It is transform indeed. So we, we called count each in Q, and the equivalent of that in C++ is transform, and our count function is stood colon colon ranges colon colon distance. So now this does the exact same thing that the Q chunk, uh, count each, each chunk does. Anybody know the next one we want to call? Or a question? I don't think, I could be wrong about this, Tristan might know if, if this is incorrect, but I don't think you can actually call size on a range. Um, I think so, uh, is, that, is that correct? Size requires a, a size range, that is something that knows the size and constant of time, whereas distance might iterate over the range to see how many elements there are. So yeah, I'll repeat the question. The question was, can you use stood colon colon size here? And the abridged answer is that stood colon colon size has higher requirements which I don't think worked for this example. It might, uh, but stood colon colon ranges distance has uh, looser requirements, so you should probably prefer that when you're dealing with ranges. For the next range adapter, does anybody know? This one's the trickier one. It was the prior that we had in Q. So this is adjacent transform. We want to look at two adjacent elements, and the operation that we want to do here is min. Unfortunately, because of overload resolution, we can't actually just directly pass stood min, so we have to wrap this in a lambda. Very sad, but uh, that's what we have. And note here that we actually got the n minus 1 elements that we wanted. We don't have that copying of the first element to be the first output element. And this is the correct generic behavior, in my opinion. And once we have this, we're just going to make a, a call to std colon colon ranges colon colon max, and then we just multiply this by 2, and we end up with 4. So, pretty nice. But I just I gave you a little preview. Two very irritating things about this code. Does anybody know what either of them are? So lambda was the first one. And we can fix this with my combinator library. So <laughs> if you import, uh, you know, use combinators, um, you end up with the following. And uh, while we're at it, std colon colon equal to is a little bit verbose. So let's replace that as well. And uh, there we go. So that was the first issue. This is kind of a joke, you know, probably you don't want to do this in production, but uh, for the purposes of slideware and conference talks, definitely. Does anybody know what the second irritating thing? This is a bit more subtle. Max. Yes, and why? So the, the answer was max, but... It's not pipe. Exactly. So the, the max is not pipeable. And why is that? That's because it's an algorithm. It's not a range adapter. And I guess it wouldn't be a range adapter. It would be like a range sync or something like that. But we don't... Those don't currently... I believe they're called... Uh, like, I actually don't know that. So it is a reduction, but I don't know what they're called in range v3. I think they're just actions. actions. Um, well, so actions are the eager ones. They're not necessarily uh, ones that collapse things down or collect. I guess actually that's true. They, they are. So ac actions are what they're called. Actions in range v3 don't exist in standard C++ at the moment. They might in the future, but in C++ 20 and 23, they don't. However, introducing, what point of the talk are we? We're doing fantastic. Introducing circle, folks. We love it. This is actually extremely exciting. So what did we just do there? We just switched compilers from C++23 GCC13 to the latest circle. And now we can make use of a feature called the pipeline operator with placeholder. So before we talk about this solution, what is circle? In case you haven't listened to one of the four podcasts that Sean has been promoting it, or the C++ Now talk keynote where he talked about it, circle is a sort of next generation compiler that's uh, being worked on by an individual by the name of Sean Baxter. He's been working on it for years. And uh, it is an, a very exciting technology. Some think it's the future of C++. Um, it's a basically ISO standard compliant C++ compiler. But on top of that, he has a ton of new language features that either are in proposals in the pipeline for C++ or are just experimental things that people have said they wanted for C++. Um, if you haven't checked this out, it's on Gobble. You can go to my links in the LinksMD and uh, check out Circle. Um, if you want to learn more, uh, Bryce and I interviewed Sean over three episodes. Two of those episodes, we talked about you know, uh, Circle and how it compares to C++ and Carbon and CPP Front, the different sort of successor initiatives. And there was a follow-up episode to that where he was just talking about what he thought the future of C++ should be. Spoiler, it's Circle. Um, <laughs> but uh, you know, enough plugging uh, you know, uh, our interview. There's a ton of other resources. So he has the website. I first heard of Circle when he was on CPP Chat back in, I believe it was 2019. I was living 
in Silicon Valley at that point. He then went on CPP Cast uh, briefly later. He then gave a talk at C++ Now, and even more recently, so just in like the last three or four months, he gave a talk, uh, one at Bloomberg, Bloomberg and one at the New York C++ Meetup. I haven't even watched those, uh, but so tons of sort of older content, newer content if you're interested. I think even if you're not interested in the technology, it's interesting to listen to what he's been doing. It's very, very impressive. So uh, back to the solution. Basically what's happening here is we have this pipeline operator with a dollar sign placeholder. So where the pipe operator implicitly puts your sort of output of the previous range adapter or factory in the first argument of your uh, next function, here we basically do that explicitly, which means that you don't need to have the pipe operator overloaded in order to make use of this sort of linear chaining pattern. Anything that takes arguments can be used with this placeholder uh, dollar sign, which is fantastic because it means that we can now move the std ranges max to the end and read this you know, top to bottom or left to right, if you will, which is, I think for me, like I always want to read linear code. Whenever I look at some Lisp code where it's like completely inside out and it's not using like a threading macro from closure, it's always backwards. So I just want to read like I read a textbook, you know, left to right, or even if it's backwards, you know, right to left, like that's still linear. Like I'll settle for that, but I don't want to do inside out where it's linear, linear, linear. Now I need to go back to the front to get that range as max. So this is uh, extremely awesome in my opinion. And uh, note that if you are going to, oh, sorry, question. I think you could use the pipeline operator. Actually, no. I, so the question was, can you, can you destructure the dollar sign? I don't believe that exists right now. However, Bryce and I have talked about, there was a proposal back in 2016 about combining structure bindings with uh, the par parameter list of generic lambdas. Um, it hasn't gone anywhere in the standard, but we mentioned it and sort of on the podcast said, Sean, if you're listening, uh, maybe implement this. And then he said, why just stop at you know, generic lambdas? Why not just do it for functions as well? So in the future, something like that might be possible, but it's not currently with the, with the placeholder syntax. Question? It is. So this has been proposed for C++ 26. So the question was, uh, this has been, or was a comment, this has been proposed for C++. And the answer is yes. Uh, it is proposed for C++ 26. However, in the Issaquah meeting, which was two meetings ago, they looked at this in EWG, and there was no uh, consensus or interest, which is part of this talk is to convince them that they are completely wrong. And you'll see why, that this completely increases the readability of what I think is just like a mess later on. Um, but yes, it is proposed. I do have hope. If not, we can just all go use circle. Um, <laughs> but thank you for the question. Um, sorry for the throw. <laughs> so if you are going to go use this on Godbolt, um, in order to use the uh, placeholder and uh, uh, pipeline syntax, you need to basically specify where the GCC toolchain and library is. Uh, however, I don't go recommend typing this out. Just go to my links.md, click on one of those Godbolt links, and I already have all the default uh, uh, command line arguments that you need to get this to work. So. Um, so yeah, just go click on one of the things that says circle, and this will work. So I believe what we're going to do now is we're going to look at uh, the Haskell solution. So this is what I wrote back in 2019, um, which when I said I like reading things left to right or right to left, this is kind of what I was referring to. Because in Haskell, you need to read things bottom up. So group is the equivalent of the C++23 chunk by. It has built into it the default binary, oper binary operation equal. Then map length is our transform distance. Map adjacent min is our adjacent transform min. Maximum is our range is max, and then the times two is just our times two. So this is almost Haskell code, which I love. <laughs> and we can compare this to the Q solution. And what's interesting is I actually gave a talk back in May at a array language conference, and I showed this Q solution, and then I got uh, two different sort of messages afterwards from uh, two individuals by the name of Attila and Phineas, who are extremely good Q Q programmers. And they pointed out that um, this actually isn't optimal. Um, and I thought this was just extremely interesting. So here we're making use of a function called chunk. And chunk actually isn't built in. Everything else is a built in. But chunk here is a convenience function that I wrote. So basically, differ looks at adjacent elements and just compares equal to, figures out which ones are different. And then where gives you the indices of where those differences happen. So if you have sort of the values, you know, 1, 1, 2, 2, uh, 3, you're going to get back sort of the, the difference between the 1 and the 2, 
and the two and the three. And if you generate the indices, you're then going to get back basically where those, val those sequences change value. And so you combine that where differ with cut, and then it slices your arrays at, at that point. So that's, it's basically just a very quick way to spell chunk. But he pointed out that you don't actually need to do the cut. Once you have the indices from your function where, you can just do an adjacent difference on those indices. And that will get you the length of each of those chunks. So materializing those sublists is unnecessary, which is fantastic. Maybe not so much for the ranges code, but if you're trying to parallelize this, chunking things or splitting things leads to like doing segmented stuff. And if you can avoid that, uh, that's fantastic. And so now, basically, we're going to spell this solution um, in C++. So there's a slight difference that I believe here. You need to actually append the final length in order to get that final chunk uh, di distance. Um, but that's just a small optimization. So we're going to now we're going to do the exact same thing we did before. So this is just an alternative way of solving this problem. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do zip width. And note that at the very top here, we're now using namespace ranges colon colon views instead of std colon colon views. And this is because we need access to that concat function. So concat doesn't currently exist in C++ 23, but hopefully it will in C++ 26. Everything else is uh, available in C++ 23. Note, though, that zip width is what range v3 calls zip transform. Um, so if we go back a step, we've got our, our list of ones and twos, and now we want to do our differ. We want to figure out where are these things different. And we do that by doing a zip width and basically checking any Q when they're not equal to. And we're doing a drop one so that we can compare adjacent values. And this just gives us back trues and falses. In array languages, a true and a false is just a one and a zero. So one is true, zero is false. I'm doing it here just as ones and zeros because it's easier to see this uh, slide where. After this, we want to do our, our where function. We want to get the indices that correspond to the ones. However, we don't have that in C23. But we, or sorry, question. Drop is the on the second sequence. So, but it drops from the beginning of the sequence. oh yeah, from the beginning of the sequence. Yeah. So the question was, where does drop drop from? And it drops from the beginning of the sequence. Um, there are other languages that have like a drop last or drop reverse that does the same kind of thing, but we don't have that in C plus um, plus. And note too that I kind of skimmed over this, but this is one of the great things. And we're using circle here, which is why we've got the pipeline. But I've piped into our algorithm our sequence twice, which is not possible with just ranges as they exist in C++ today. So the ability to pipe your sequence into two different places in an algorithm, which is extremely useful when you're using the variadic ones. If you're using Cartesian product, a lot of the time you just want to do like two different iota sequences on the length of two different things. This is super, super convenient. Why isn't this an adjacent transform? Why isn't this an adjacent transform? Because that does not exist in range uh, v3. Great question. We're going to get to that. We're going we're gonna to do something that kind of makes it exist. Um, so the next thing we want to do is we want to build up that where function. So get indices that correspond to the ones. Does anybody know? We're going to, we're going to hand roll that ourselves. Does anybody know how we're going to do that, though? What well, the first thing we might want to do? Oh, wow. We could have used enumerate, but I forgot that enumerate existed. So we're going to do zip iota, which is basically enumerate. Um, that's a great, I'm going to fix that for uh, my next talk. So yeah, enumerate, which I always forget about because it barely got into C++23. Uh, exists now, but that way to hand roll enumerate is just zip iota, which is why I kind of wanted it to be called zip with index or zip with iota. And then, uh, sorry, chocolate. And uh, sorry. <laughs> and uh, after this, so now you've basically just bundled with each of your values the index, and um, and then now we just want to filter for the ones that have a one. So we get rid of any any pair that has a zero as the first element we want to get rid of, and uh, we're left with this. And now we don't care about the ones that we were sort of using to collect. So we can just do uh, a transform that gets rid of this. So in order to do that, we can call transform with second. And so note that underscore FST and underscore SND are just uh, shortcuts for std colon colon get zero and std colon colon get one, uh, which is how you access the you know, elements of a tuple. But that's way too verbose, so we added convenience things for that in my combinator library. Does anybody know a simpler way to spell transform second, though? Elements. Exactly, elements. And does anybody know a better way to spell elements one? Values, exactly. So uh, I skip straight to values. But this is kind of an example where what does values mean here? We're not dealing with a key value pair. We're dealing with a, a pair that is an index and sort of an element. However, values is the shortest way to spell this. And I'm an array language programmer, so I'm always going to choose the shortest way. Probably elements one here is, is more descriptive, though, um, which is why I don't really like the aliases here. But hey, values does the trick. So now we have our indices. 
Now what we need to do is we need to concatenate a zero at the beginning and the length of the sequence at the end to make sure that we don't miss the chunks, the first chunk and the last chunk. Because here, you're just going to get the internal chunks, uh, lengths of the chunks. So we're just going to concat zero and concat the length of our number of sushis. And note that this is another e amazing example of why the placeholder is so useful. Because here, we've got three different arguments to our variadic concat function. And we're building up two different singles. Single is just basically turning a value into a range of one value. And so we have zero, the size, and the, and the dollar sign basically enables us to pipe to the middle argument of three arguments, which is this is completely not possible with C++ 20 or 23 ranges that exist, as it exists today. So once we have this, we now have all our indices. Now we need to do the deltas. We need to do the adjacent difference and get basically just the difference between these values. We can do that with a zip width. And now the binary operation that we want is minus. The convenience for that in my combinator library is sub. That's similar to what Python calls it. And uh, now that we have basically the differences, we want to do the, pri the min prior that we saw in both solutions, which once again is just going to be zip width. And now the binary operation is min. And once we have that, we're going to pipe this to std range as max, multiply it by 2, and we end up with our solution. So this is a lot, but it's more of a mental exercise to show that we can you know, create these two different pipelines with two different solutions. And uh, we can actually make this a little bit nicer. So Bryce pointed out earlier, how come we're not just using adjacent transform? Well, that's because adjacent transform doesn't exist in range v3. And you can't mix and match. If, right now, currently, if you're in range v3 land, you can't mix that with standard. Um, so uh, we can add a couple convenience functions. So if we add an adjacent transform 2, and you can think of this as just adjacent transform with the template argument as 2, that's basically what we have a couple different times in our code. Zip width. And then we're, we're basically piping something with a dropped element and a binary operation, which we're calling op here. That's what adjacent transform is. So we don't effectively have it, but we kind of have a shortcut function that we can do this with. And then what's really interesting is the functions in Q, differ and deltas, are just specializations of adjacent transform. So differ is a specialization of adjacent transform with the not equal to binary operation. And deltas is a specialization with the uh, binary operation minus, which I call sub. However, you might notice this underscore C. So what is underscore C? C is the C combinator, which flips the order of the arguments that you're passing to your function. So if you notice, actually, in the previous slide, I was dropping uh, from the second element, or, or basically passing the one that was dropping the first element first, so that you ended up subtracting the first element from the second element. But you can't do that with minus. Minus just applies them in the order, but you can flip it uh, with the C combinator. If you're familiar with uh, Louis Dion's uh, boost library, he has a, a, a boost library called HANA. And they have a function called flip there, a meta template a, a TMP function that basically does this. Uh, but it is a few more characters than mine. So, um, and, then, <laughs> and then we can build up our indices function by basically just uh, you know, uh, taking the four functions out, the zip, the filter, the values, and the concat and then putting them all together. And if we use now differ deltas, indices, and adjacent transform two, um, and go back to our previous solution, we can shorten this. And it looks very similar now to the Q solution. It's obviously a lot more verbose. But if you remember what we saw, we saw differ. Then we saw where, which is what we call indices. Q calls it where. I believe APL calls this function where, but J and BQN call this function indices, which I, I prefer compared to where, because where is overloaded when you get into the SQL context. Um, and then concat which we were doing with a, a comma in Q, deltas, adjacent transform, which is the min prior, and then max. So this is a lot more verbose than Q code, but I actually think that this is, this is like a really, really nice solution. Uh, and potentially in the future, we might get some of these convenience functions like deltas and differ in, in indices. So uh, fantastic. Any questions? We're going to pause here because we're about to go on a bit of a digression. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yep. So zip width considers those ranges, right? So what if they're not? What if they're input ranges? Like the key reference that's under the covers there is going to split up. So that is a very, very good observation. So the question was, what if uh, the dollar signs from sushi are input ranges? And there is a discussion of this in the paper. When Sean was implementing it, he realized that I think the proposed design didn't even work. So he chose his own semantics. So I don't actually understand those semantics. For my examples, they work. But something like that would 
have to be addressed. And I know, Tristan, you pointed this out when I tweeted something on Twitter about this being like, there's, this is great, but there's a couple issues with this. And there is some kind of, in this code, implicit thing happening. Is there like a copy happening? Or, or, and, like, and so you know, there was a suggestion is like, should something more explicit be done there in order to you know, let, the, let the user of the code know that you know, there's some magic happening behind the scenes? But uh, yeah, this, for the semantics of that, I would ping Sean on, or actually, I should just figure out what the semantics are and then have the answer for that in my next talk. But it, it's a great question and great observation. Any other questions? I think there are some similarities between uh, this, the new pipe operator and its two binds. Um, where, so bind introduces the placeholders, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, yeah. And uh, so I wonder if there's any thought to that. Um, I have not given any thought to that. I know that um, there is a boost library called Lambda 2 that you can do a bunch of really nice things with. Um, so the question was, uh, there is a. Uh, some sort of overlap between what you can do with you know std colon colon binds and the placeholders and uh, my response to that is yes there definitely is and there's a boost li library called lambda two that enables you to do this like underscore one and underscore two to get these placeholders and pass them around I know that Barry is very familiar with what's possible in that library and he's the individual Barry Rebs and the individual behind the C plus plus twenty six proposal for this so what was borrowed you know I'm not sure but he's he's definitely that stuff is on his radar I think I saw. Was there a hand? Yeah. Um, yeah, you compared this to the for loop uh, and just creating a script uh, for the solution. Like, what are the like comparisons uh, from like memory usage or something like that? Great question. So the question was, how do you compare? Uh, this to the for loop, we are going to maybe not in, in as much detail as you want, but we can chat after. But I, I, that is a great segue into the next thing that we're going to talk about. And uh, so I think. All right, so this, this point that I'm about to make here, we're about to go on the digression, is that this is what it looks like with the pipeline operator and the placeholder. Without that, switching back to C++, this is what we get. So because the variadic ranges, concat, uh, zip width, zip, none of those are pipeable, we now need to pass things in uh, as arguments, which means there is a mixture of piping and non-piping. And because we're not able to pass things in twice, we have to declare things as locals so we can name them and then pass those in as many times as we want. So we have to name indices, we have to name deltas. And like, I don't, I don't want to over-index on this, but this is like the reason that I think that this should be standardized, because we have this amazing set of ranges that we can pipeline together. But it's incomplete, in my opinion, if we're trying to build up a sequence of these things that could be very, very readable and linear, but we, we, we kind of trip over ourselves because whenever we hit the variadic ones, we need to do something different. Whenever we need to pipe things in multiple times, we need to name things. And I just think compared to you know, this solution, uh, this is much, much more readable, top to bottom, you're done, uh, versus this one, which is kind of inside out, sometimes pipelining, naming things, jumping around. There's a lot more state you need to keep in your head when you're reading this solution. So uh, anyways, overall though, absolutely love the fact that we can write this kind of code in C++23. Um, and this, I believe, is where, so this is all new. We did this last night, and uh, hopefully all the slides are animated correctly. But uh, I gave this talk a couple weeks ago at Italian C++, and uh, it was received really well, but it went on YouTube just a few days ago. And, um, you know, once again, we got a couple comments in this, you know, loops are easier to read, understand, and so this is the YouTube comment that says, why does he show such a crazy solution for the for, uh, for loop based solution? If you're gonna be clever using ranges, you should be able to be clever in your loop based solution. Here's an example. And so uh, let's take a look at this example. Because uh, at first I thought, okay, yeah, whatever, some people like for loops. But then while I was watching uh, Bjorn Fowler's talk yesterday, at like the 10 minute mark before his talk was ending, I remember seeing something in this solution. I was like, oh my goodness, this is gonna be fantastic. I'm not gonna point it out because I'm gonna ask you uh, to see if, if folks can catch things. So, this doesn't compile. It's a small, I don't actually, you know, fault uh, OMG Clueless is the uh, username on YouTube. Um, I don't fault uh, them for um, this compilation error because it's small, but can anyone catch it? Exactly, right there. So, uh, he, I mean, he didn't actually say it was, but he, he muttered, uh, you know, maybe some explicitives in uh, what is N, and uh, that is the correct answer, oh, sorry. That goes, goes to that individual. Uh, N is nothing. N should be sushi.size. So it's a, it's a small mistake. It doesn't actually change the semantics of the answer, but the first thing we need to do is get rid of this N and change it to sushi.size. So now compiles, step one. We're good to go. However, this solution does not work. 
And I'm going to show you the test case that fails. And I don't want to spend too much time, but let's see if anybody can figure out what the problem is. It took me about 20 seconds, so I'll give you that much time. <laughs> then again, I've been thinking about this problem for a couple years, so. <laughs> so and, and to be clear, the correct answer is four, but this solution gives six. Uh, that's actually what my first thought was. But that, so the, the comment was, is it that we're setting current run to one? But that's actually correct. That's just saying that uh, at minimum, your contiguous equal values in a row has to be one. So that's actually correct. A couple more seconds. Yes, well, two people said it at the same time, but I think we had a new individual that is chocolateless. There we go. So the, the comment from the crowd was max run on sort of the fourth last line is being initialized to the first value of your vector that's storing sort of the continu contiguous values in a row, which is incorrect in this case because that first value is going to be three, but it's going to end up being minimized. You're going to you're going to take the min of three and two. So you can't initialize it to 3, because that's going to end up being the maximum value. And when you multiply it by 2, you end up with 6. So you need to change how you initialize max run. It needs to be uh, std colon min of the first element and the second element. And then you need to change. Well, you don't need to change, but you should change your index to be equal to 2. And I'm not even going to begin to see if there's other bugs in this code. This passed my three simple unit tests, so we'll assume that it's correct. But the indexing starting at 2 and indexing into two different things, there may be some use cases that this doesn't work for. Um, the other thing, too, is I found it a bit odd that I don't know if this was intentional or not, but the else case in the first if statement, they've put a semicolon, uh, two semicolons in that, and I, I think that's just terrible. Uh, but still, this is a shorter solution than my solution, if we compare the two. You know, mine is a little bit more verbose. And so I thought, OK, you know, sure. But then, but then I realized something. There is a major difference between this solution and my solution. Does anybody know what it is? The allocation, yes. And so this is what I, when, when I was in Bjorn Faller's talk, I remembered seeing a pushback in this YouTube comment. And then I thought, a pushback means there's a vector, and a vector means that there's linear memory allocation. And this is one of what is now the key points of this talk, is that like, you know, a, a part of this is like fantastic because, you know, sure, it didn't compile. That was a small mistake. But the fact that there was a bug in the code is that like, this kind of code is a lot more bug prone than when you're, when you're just chaining up a bunch of you know, uh, range adapters. Sure, that stuff is a little bit harder to debug, but I think you end up writing way less bugs because you don't need to worry about off by one errors and indexing and all these edge conditions. You're chaining up and doing collection-oriented programming of these range adapters that you know work. So if you are just composing a bunch of things that you know work and not hand rolling everything yourself, the opportunity to make mistakes is a lot smaller. So this is now like a comparison of you know, my initial for loop. But Question? You still, you still have to handle edge cases because you have to do the chunk hat um, of the In one of the solutions, not in the chunk by one. So the, the comment was, I still have to um, consider edge cases as well. And uh, the answer is yes sometimes. But like, that was an alternative solution that I needed to hand roll some uh, you know, adapters that didn't exist. But I think that like, the actual best range of solution when you're doing a single left to right sequence pass is using that chunk by because there's no overhead for that. If you're going to start to parallelize things, you know, it might be a little bit different. Question at the back? Just to support your case, I think there's still a bug in that code when two shoes are meant to be collected. So I think for the purposes of this problem um, in the competitive programming contest, they, they guarantee that there's at least you know, uh, two different values, so you're going to end up with a, a minimum answer. But yes, in the general case, you're going to run into corner cases. Uh, so yeah, the question was, there, I think there are still bugs in this code if you have an empty list and stuff. But for the purposes of these kind of you know, algorithmic trying to solve in a few minutes, I try to try to ignore you know, the production use casing and, and fuzzing all this stuff. I definitely have not fuzzed Sushi for two, either of those solutions. Um, but this is sort of a comparison now between you know, these three different solutions, my initial loop, uh, OMG Clueless's loop comment from YouTube, and then the range of solutions. So the first thing, they all have the same time complexity. You know, modulus, some constant, you know, they're all linear. You have to pass, you have to do a single pass over the sequence. And actually, you're doing two passes over two different sequences in OMG Clueless's, but it, it's still linear in the length of your initial sequence. However, the memory complexity of OMG Clueless's loop uh, or solution is linear. And this is one of the key things that is awesome about ranges. 
regardless of how many things you're piping up together, you're going to end up with constant memory and like a single pass over the data, which is absolutely fantastic. Which is this, this is the stream fusion that's talked about in that uh, parallel block delayed sequences. Bug prone. You know, I didn't really talk about this in the initial version of this talk I gave, but like it's clearly from going through that individual's comment, you know, there was a bug in it. And I wasn't even expecting there to be a bug. I just wanted to compare actually like how long was his solution or their solution versus mine. Um, whereas the range is, you know, you could you can this is more philosophical. You can argue that it's bug prone, but I, I think for the purposes of the examples I'm showing, I think that the chunk by solution is is it's way harder to get that wrong. Readability. We're not going to debate about this. This is, <laughs> this is a biased take, but I think if you learn the range adapters, this ends up being way more readable code. You know, we can argue after the, uh, the talk if you want, but uh, you know, put an asterisk next to this. This is Connor's personal opinion that I think the range's code is way more readable. And last but not least, declarative. In the YouTube comment solution, there was one vector that was being mutated and two integers that were being uh, mutated. In my for loop solution, there was four integers that were carrying the local state that were being mutated. In ranges? Let's go back to the solution. Actually, no, I didn't have a slide for that. If you go back, there's absolutely nothing being mutated, which is why people get confused about functional programming. They think, how do you get anything done if there's no mutation? Well, it's you bundle all of that in these functions that in Haskell are doing recursion, that in C++ 23 ranges in 20, they're just doing iteration. But like, when you use them, you're not actually mutating anything yourself. That's all happening behind the scenes, and it's just return you know, the result of pipe, 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 and a reduction at the end, and then you're done. You technically have not, you know, really mutated anything yourself personally, uh, which is fantastic. And then I added this at the last second because, um, in my opinion, the uh, for loop versions aren't as parallelizable as the ranges versions. And internally at NVIDIA, we have a couple different initiatives where we are trying to parallelize this stuff. Bryce, question. Okay, but you had two ranges versions. One used a chunk by and one used a filter. So the comment is that there were two solutions. Uh, one of them used chunk by and one of them used filter. Uh, which is correct. There are ranges that are harder to parallelize than others, but filters a lot harder. But the point being is that if you have these primitives, you can design it in such a way that like there is a sandbox of range adapters that if you use, everything will be extremely fast. I mean, it's it's not dissimilar from the parallel algorithms as they exist today in C++ 17 and 20. There are certain algorithms that are just more easily transformed, reduces, et cetera. And then we have things like sorts. Sorts is not as easy to parallelize, but we still do a good job doing it. But like, if you can spell your solution avoiding sorts and just making use of transforms, reductions, and scans, you're going to end up with way, way faster code that's running on the GPU compared to something that's making use of a sort. So at the end of the day, we will be able to accelerate everything. But, and I think that's you know, part of our job at NVIDIA is, is making sure that people that are using these libraries know which are the things that are going to be super, super fast and which are the ones you're going to take a bit of a performance hit for, which is why we release all these profiling tools. So um, you know, this is the best solution, in my opinion, still, uh, for the ranges code, at least. And uh, I think that is going to bring us to uh, the last two examples, which are much, much simpler. So we've only got uh, 20 minutes left, I believe, here. But I think going through both of these, you know, this one's going to take maybe five minutes, and the last one will take five minutes as well if we burn through it. So that we'll have lots of time for questions. Um, and I'll get, get you a chocolate here, Bryce. I'm not sure, not sure if you got one yet. Uh, so the max gap, this is a, a problem that we've actually talked about on two different episodes on ADSP, uh, one of my favorite problems. It's a lot simpler. So you're given a list of integers, and you want to determine if you sort the sequence, what's the largest difference between two adjacent elements? So even in the description of that problem, you can see probably pretty quickly how we're going to solve this using the range adapters. So the first thing we need to do is sort. The second thing we need to do is take the difference between adjacent elements. And then after this, we just want to identify the maximum, which here is 4. So the answer to this you know, unit test is 4. So how do we do that in C++? The first thing we need to do is make a call to a sort algorithm, which unfortunately, because we don't have actions which exist in range v3, we just have to call our sort algorithm that exists in C20. Then we need to make a call to adjacent transform. Here, we don't have to wrap minus in a lambda because there's no overload resolution problems. And uh, once we do this, we just want to um, pass this to range as max, and we're good to go. However, there's a bug. Does anybody notice it? The bug. Sorry, can you say that again? The bug is that std minus is being applied in the wrong order. 
because we've sorted the sequence in increasing value. And so you're going to subtract the small, you're going to subtract the larger value from the smaller value and end up with negative elements, or the max you would get with zero if you have a, a adjacent equal elements. So there's a couple different ways we can fix this. Um, the first one maybe that comes to mind is reversing our sort. You could also do this by passing a custom comparator or you know std colon colon greater to your sort algorithm. Uh, my preferred solution is just by using the C combinator once again because this is exactly what you want. Um, but yeah, small bug. And uh, this once again is my preferred solution because we're running into the max problem where uh, you know we're calling max as the first thing, and now we can pipe this. Question. Correct, yes, yeah. so the question was, does the C combinator only work for binary operations? Yes, uh, I mean, if you had, I mean, there are other combinators that will rearrange the ordering of your arguments, but I don't find those as useful. If you have a, a ternary function that takes three arguments, uh, and you're like, there's now how many different permutations? Is it three, six? I don't even know. But so like you could have, you know, a plethora of combinators, but the most common one, I don't even think, I think I've ever needed to reach for, like a, I think in uh, stack languages, like joy and forth, they have a combinator called uh, ROT, which is short for rotate, which actually you can do exactly that. You can rotate your, so I guess you can't do like a permutation, um, but probably with like swap and rotate, you could get your arguments in any order you wanted. But um, yeah, C just works for binary functions. So I think that, Sorry. yep. Min would not work because we're looking for the, so the question was, could you use std colon colon min instead of std colon colon minus? Sorry? You're getting negative values, so. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, yeah, min, min would work if you at the end of it also, so the, the question was, could min work with a sorted sequence and then you know you're just uh, getting negative values, but the negative values will be consistent with the actual difference, so if you do std, colon, colon, min, and then transform the final value or just multiply the final value by negative one, yes, that would work. Wouldn't recommend it, though, because <laughs> it's a good observation. That does work, but uh, it's a little bit uh, backwards for, for what you want. Yeah, I would definitely be uh, um, stood colon, colon, greater, or you know, uh, doing a C combinator thing is, is slightly better. So this brings us to um, our last example, uh, filter out HTML tags, which, if you have seen my CPP North talk from 2022 entitled The Twin Algorithms is actually an example that I went over in that talk. Um, so we'll, we're gonna quickly go through it. And the reason that I'm bringing this up is uh, I gave that talk in July of 2022, and then Barry ended up including this example in one of his papers that was proposing the placeholder uh, syntax and showing that sort of this example um, you know, suffers from a few problems and is made a lot nicer. So uh, this code is sort of the code that I showed, you know, we might get this in the future in C++23. And uh, I'm happy to report, I mean, technically this is circle code because it's using the, uh, well, it's future C++ code if we get the placeholder uh, syntax. Um, but uh, so I guess, well, this currently works now, but we are going to, before we walk through that, um, we're gonna walk through this in APL. So it says C++ North, because I did not have the energy to reanimate this just for the purposes of saying uh, C++ on C. But basically, the, the, the problem stated is you're given an HTML uh, you know, uh, text, and you wanna get rid of all the tags. So you wanna end up with just hello C++ North. So how do we do that? So the first thing we wanna do is identify all the left brackets, uh, or chevrons, if you will. And so um, this is gonna give you basically a Boolean mask of a one and zeros where one corresponds to the left. So if we put that next to it, you can see that anytime there's a left chevron bracket, it corresponds to a one. Um, so and now, because this is gonna get a little bit uh, crazy if we do this on the same line, we're gonna move this up, center it, and uh, from now on, just imagine that this is to the left of our, of our string here. So we don't just want the left chevrons, though. We want the right ones as well. So we can switch this to a membership function, which is basically just checking for each of the elements in our string. Does it exist in either you know, of the two characters in this string? So now we have sort of two ones and zeros. And uh, I guess I don't animate that. But so the next thing we want to do, and the reason that I showed this problem in the talk, is this is one of the coolest applications of a scam. It uses a not equal to scam. So I don't have 10 minutes to walk through this slowly, but Basically, if you look at the ones and zeros, what it does is it sh every time it meets a one, it, it, then see, it then converts everything after it, which is a zero, to a one, until it meets the next one. 
which is a very cool like masking algorithm when you need to get rid of things. And uh, you might not think of sort of getting rid of like nested uh, tags as like a parallelizable thing, but you, when you spell it in this fashion with a scan, it actually becomes a very, very par parallelizable thing. So we do the not equal to scan, so the, the backslash is the scan and the not equal to is not equal to, and then you end up with 11111, which correspond to the things that we either want to get rid of or um, keep. So in this case, it's what we want to uh, get rid of. You can see sort of the first four ones correspond to the less than div. Then we want to sort of complement this because we have a function that keeps things, doesn't get rid of things. So the, the uh, tilde is just basically complement. It switches zeros to ones and ones to zeros. And uh, then we basically make use of our filter function. Sorry, go ahead. Shouldn't it be five for the div example? So great question. The question is, shouldn't it be five? You're jumping ahead. So yes, you've already spotted a problem with this, which we're going to fix in a, a couple characters here. So once we have this uh, ones corresponding to most of the characters we want to keep, we call it with uh, forward slash, which in this case is basically filter. It's called compress. So anything that corresponds to a one will keep anything that corresponds to a zero we're going we're to toss out. And if we do this uh, with the following characters, we're going to end up with the following, which is exactly what Flores just pointed out there. We've we're, got a couple extra things here. So in order to do this, we basically need to combine this, which is we're going to convert to a zip width. We just add a couple characters that says, you know, make sure that that last uh, equal sign or that last chevron gets included. And the first time I gave this, um, uh, Adam, who is a, you know, one of the co-hosts on my podcast, pointed out that you know that you can combine a couple of those characters there into the thing with a little squiggly on top. And I was like, there's your array programmers for you. Anytime you can save a character. I personally think this is a little bit more confusing, but that's just because I don't understand what that character does. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it doesn't matter for you because you probably don't understand what any of these characters do. So. Um, but anyways, at this point, we basically have our, uh, our, our final hello C++ on C, you know, here it says north. But now, we're going to convert this, you know, all at once to C++. So technically, we're using the placeholder, but now you can see here, we're running into the problems where building up this mask, which is going to correspond to the things that we keep, um, needs to be named, because we need to pass this twice uh, to the scan left that's going to do the not equal to, and then to the initial. Um, so. And that's what that sort of the, the logical or angle bracket mask and then angle bracket mask that's piped to the scan left, that's what's capturing that last uh, chevron. And then once we do that, we, we're just zipping, filtering, and then taking out the, the characters from the string view that we need. Um, but now, in circle, with the pipeline operator, we can spell this, which is like, you, like at this point, it's just like, I'm so excited because every single problem that I'm running into that I think, oh, I can do this in an array language super succinctly, I can now convert into C++23, or circle, which currently has the placeholder syntax. And obviously, it's a lot more verbose. When we want to do you know, uh, something that you would do with rank polymorphism that's you know, zipping a scalar with a, a, a rank one array, that's going to you know, involve you know, calling zip transform and zip and stuff. It's, it's a lot more verbose, but you still are actually getting something that I think is quite nice compared to like, you know, the verbose for loop that you'd have to write. And if you use my combinator library, plug, plug, you can get this down to this, which uh, we don't have time to explain exactly what the phi combinator is doing here. But basically, these underscore phi, you know, they're, they're doing things where we're applying you know, two different equality operations and then a binary or, and we can just sort of abstract all this stuff and, and get rid of all the lambda syntax. And we've got you know, underscore or, underscore not equal to, the B combinator that composes two unary operations. Anyways, this is just more food for thought that you know, combinators are possible in C++. And, uh, Sorry? What is scan, left? scan left is just a partial sum. Okay, what it return? uh, returns a, a sequence of n values that, so it's scan left not equal to, is like, so it would be the equivalent of, so the question was, what does scan left do here? Is it an action or a view? It's a, it's a view. It's a, it's a lazy left scan. And like, that's because we're in range land here. I mean, you made the same comment. So Tristan came on our podcast, and uh, we were, you were talking about scan, and then you made a comment, Bryce, about how. Uh, well, that's the semantics of that scan aren't parallelizable, but that is the point of a stream fusion library is that things go left to right. But we could do a parallel version of this, which would have different semantics. But it would still work, because not equal to, would it actually work? If we had, you know, because it's associative only. Anyways, scan left is just basically partial sum. It's actually broken, but it works for the purposes of this example, because scan left doesn't exist in C++23. So I hand rolled it with a transform, but that violates the constraints uh, of the lambda that is being passed to scan left. But the details, you know, don't really matter. The example works, so. Uh, <laughs> and I think 
that brings us to sort of the conclusion of this talk. So in summary, um, these are the you know, C++ range adapters and factories that exist in C++ 20 and 23. 20 is on the left, 23 is on the right. I can see a couple of people taking a photos. All, this, all these slide decks are, you can check the Discord link or just go straight to my GitHub repo. Um, on top of this, you know, here's a, a, a cute little sort of brief summary of what each of them are doing. There's a gobble link, so you can go and play around with this, change the values if you want to, you know, get more familiar with how these things work. On top of this, this is the current status as of yesterday, GCC 13, all of the range adapters work. You can see down at the bottom, ranges colon colon two, which is the thing that converts something from a, a range into like a container, like a string or a vector, only is implemented in MSVC right now, but it'll be coming in GCC at some point. Formatting, support with std colon colon format doesn't work yet, but that's coming as well. You can just use the format library on uh, God, uh, Godbolt and Compiler Explorer. Uh, so yeah, MSVC, everything's implemented. It just hasn't made its way upstream uh, to Compiler Explorer yet, so hopefully this will get updated to all green in the future, and Clang still needs work to do. Um, this, you know, probably the, the memory complexity is really what I want to highlight here, uh, is that when you're dealing with ranges, you end up with constant memory, single pass, you know, linear time complexity. If you're doing Cartesian product, that's gonna increase the time complexity. But in general, this is a very efficient way uh, to write your code, and it leads to you know, less bug prone and more readable code. And uh, once again, all the links to this stuff, if you wanna go play around with it, you can find it on my links.md. And yeah, we should all be excited because we can now write code like this. Thank you.